We've started chapter 11 on waves and we're doing the slinky lab. Everybody should have a slinky and I've asked everyone to make a wave on the slinky. What do you do? You make a disturbance and the wave travels along the slinky. The disturbance you made was up and down, but the wave traveled to the right. In this example, we say the displacement of the medium is perpendicular to the direction of the wave propagation. This is what we call a transverse wave. Another way of making a disturbance in the medium is to grab some coils and squeeze them tighter and then let them go. In this case, the displacement of the medium is parallel to the direction of the wave propagation. That's called a compressional wave, also known as a longitudinal wave. In this introductory slinky lab, we use transverse waves. Now, whether we use a transverse wave or we use a compressional wave, the medium wants to return to an equilibrium position. What is the medium that carries these waves? It's the slinky itself. If I throw a rock in a pond, we're going to see a ripple. It's going to move out. What is the medium in that case? It's water. Clap your hand. A sound wave moves out. What's carrying that sound? Air. That's the medium. So these are examples of mechanical waves. They require a medium to carry the wave. But there's also something called a non-mechanical wave. They don't require a medium. Now, what might do that? Something that would travel through the vacuum of space? How about light? Or any electromagnetic radiation? Well, obviously, in our slinky lab, we're using a mechanical wave. The medium is the slinky, and we're going to be using it in a transverse motion. So let's say I give my hand a quick flick of the wrist and create a pulse. The pulse moves down the slinky. It's not a full wave, it's just a crest. The height of that crest is called the amplitude. How quickly I shake my hand up and down, that's the frequency. We're holding this end of the slinky fixed, and then we have to pull the slinky back and apply tension. The question for this part of the lab is what affects the speed of the wave? So what can we change? We could change the amplitude, we could change the frequency, we can change the tension. Well, let's just start with the tension. Let's say we start by pulling the slinky this far. We make a pulse and we time it to go down so we can measure the velocity. You can get good results by watching the video we posted from class. Or you can do it yourself at home, make your own video, count the frames, get good data. Then we pulled the slinky back twice the distance. But we got just about the same amount of time. This means the wave traveled twice as fast as before. Now, just because it traveled the same time, that's not the only part of the story. It's twice the distance. So make sure you understand that it traveled twice as fast. So by pulling the slinky tighter, we increase the speed. So increase tension, increase speed. In an upcoming lesson, we're going to explore this further. In the meantime, you should think about why this works this way. The next thing we can do is change the amplitude. First, we make the pulse, time it to go down. Do it again, but make it twice as high or half as high. We found out that it took about the same time. Now, it's not exact, but it's pretty darn close. If we double the amplitude, and you get like a 1% or 2% difference in time, don't worry about it. It's close enough, we'll assume it's the same. So the amplitude had no effect. Now you might think that a bigger amplitude, it would just take longer for this thing to swing up and down. But you know what? This is based on simple harmonic motion. Think about that. Did the amplitude affect the period? Now we can talk about frequency. You make a few waves real quick. That's high frequency. You can watch the video and you can see the beginning of this wave reach the end in a certain amount of time. Then we tried it with low frequency. You move your hand back and forth a little slower. Again, time the wave to get there. Turned out it was just about the same. The conclusion, 
frequency has no effect on the speed either. So at least for the Slinky Lab, tension is the only thing that's going to change that speed. Now you might notice that when we do high frequency and then low frequency, there is something that's changing. What is it? The waves seem to be longer. What do we call that? That's the wavelength. The wavelength is the distance from the crest to the crest. Maybe we can find a formula that relates the velocity to the frequency and wavelength. Well, we all know velocity is distance per time. And we can make that distance a wavelength. This distance. Well, when that is one wavelength, that's not just any old time. That's a special time. It's the time for one cycle to move past. Isn't the time for one cycle a period? Having the period on the bottom is the same as writing one over the period. That sounds familiar. It's equal to frequency. So we can say that the velocity is equal to one over the period times the wavelength or frequency times wavelength. Let's talk units. We can say frequency is cycles per second. I like to think of wavelength as meters per cycle because it is one cycle that we're measuring the length of. The cycles cancel out and we're left with meters per second. Very often you don't even see the word cycles in the equation. It's just one over seconds for frequency times meters for wavelength. Now in chemistry, you may have seen the Greek letter nu to be used for frequency and the Greek letter lambda for wavelength and the letter C for the speed of light. This is where you used it in chemistry when we were studying light. So how do you test this formula in our lab? It's a little easier to do this at school with our metal slinkies and we pull them really far. The metal slinky has more mass, so it goes slower. We'll talk more about that later. The idea is to try to count out how quickly your hand moves up and down and then measure the wavelength. But keep in mind, this whole thing is moving while you're trying to take these measurements. It isn't easy. What should be easy is a qualitative analysis. If you just make your hand go back and forth quicker, increasing the frequency, you should be able to see that the wavelength has gotten shorter. And that velocity hasn't changed because you haven't changed the tension. What's the best way of checking this formula? Making standing waves. But to understand that, we have to understand reflection. So first we take a pulse and send it down to the fixed end. And we look to see what happens when it comes back. You should be able to see that it reflected inverted. Now, why does that happen? As the wave approaches the fixed end, the wave pulls up on the end. Well, the end pulls down on the wave and that causes it to flip over. Well, now imagine if the end was free. Somehow we had a loop on the end of the slinky and it rode up and down a frictionless rod. As the wave gets to this end, it will pull up on the end, but the end is free to move. It'll just rise. It can't cause the wave to be inverted. The end just comes back down and the wave reflects upright. So remember, waves reflect off a fixed end, inverted, off a free end, upright. So what happens if we send a wave down, it reflects upside down, and then we send a second wave? Now we have a crest and a trough. What's going to happen when they meet in the middle? They're going to cancel out, but only while they're overlapping. You add the heights. They later emerge and continue on. Now, do we have any evidence that waves can pass right through each other? Well, how about thinking about talking to somebody? When you're talking to somebody and they're talking to you, do their waves bounce off of your waves and you hear an echo? No, the waves pass through each other. This is another property of waves that you can observe with the slinky in your lab. Well, how about this one? We send a trough down, it hits the end, and it reflects right side up. Now, at that moment, you send down a crest. What's going to happen when they overlap? You get a much larger crest, and they continue to move on as they pass through each other. You should be able to see this in your lab as well. 
So remember that superposition is about adding the heights when the waves overlap. So where are we going with all this? Can you imagine sending a wave down and having it reflect? And right in the middle, they'll cancel out. And then as they pass through each other, the amplitude will diminish. And then they flat. As the waves emerge, they start to grow. And the amplitude gets bigger. This is how a standing wave pattern is formed. Once you get the timing right, it looks like the waves are standing still and just moving up and down. And we call this a standing wave. We have a crest and a trough. So this is one full cycle. That's one wave. If I shake my hand a little faster, I can generate one and a half waves. Each half wave looks like it's just moving up and down. And if I go slower, I can have a crest and then later a trough. But I don't have a crest and a trough together at the same time. So that's half a wave. Well, these standing wave patterns are a great way to test that formula because you don't have to worry about things moving back and forth. You're just watching this thing going up and down, and it's easy to count that and measure it with a stopwatch. So you'll easily be able to get the frequency. But what about the wavelength? You can measure that distance. If that distance is, say, one meter, and that's half a wave, then the wavelength is two meters. Here we have a full wave in one meter. That means the wavelength is one meter. Can you figure out what the wavelength is down here? Now, what about that velocity? Have we changed the tension in the slinky in these examples? No, we've pulled them the same length for each one. So the velocity is staying constant. So you can test this formula easily. If the frequency increases, the wavelength has to decrease. And that's what you see. You should be able to test this with your slinky at home. Well, hopefully that's enough to get you through this lab. You have to follow the lab sheet, fill in the data as best you can, but the frequency and wavelength section will be hard for you to do. But you should be able to see reflection, superposition, and the standing wave section, you should get good results. If you're having trouble, please check the video of the slinky being used in the classroom. Good luck.